Hi guys, welcome back to another Friday Faves and Fails. Before we even begin, I'm having a day with my hair. It's like Monica said, it is the humidity. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, which is why it usually lives on the top of my head. But I thought I'd let it out for the video. My biggest fave, by far, of the past week, really past two weeks, because I didn't do this last week because I was really in a funk and just not feeling anything, uh, which really is what started this, is 10,000 steps a day. If you've been following my vlogs, if you've watched me on Instagram as whole recently, I am talking a lot about getting out of the house and walking. It's become um, a really odd escape for me because this is not my vibe at all. I am not a get out of the house and walk kind of person. I am let's stay in the house and play video games kind of person. I've really rallied against any kind of exercise. I have felt that it is... Um, I'm just kind of being pushed in a direction because I'm supposed to lose weight and I'm supposed to want to look a certain way and it makes me feel bad, truthfully. The idea of exercise makes me feel bad about myself because it makes me feel like I am exercising because I don't like my body, which we all go through those phases, but I'm, I've really kind of had this inner turmoil over exercise and it was like a week ago and it just clicked in me that the reason that I have been so anti-exercise is because I've got these two parts of me. One part is like, yes, of course, exercise is good for you, move your body, it's healthy. And then the other part of me is like, no, you should be happy as you are, you shouldn't feel the need to change your body, you should be confident, you shouldn't want to lose weight, blah, blah, blah. And those two things were super interconnected. Those two things were one. Exercise equals, equaled, equals losing weight. The only reason you would exercise is because you're not happy with your body. And I know lots of people told me exercise for mental health and I thought, bullshit, that's not why you're doing it. You want to get thin. Um, and last week I was just kind of like a really super low ebb, just crying all the time and just no, no reason, just really, really, really low. And I thought, I'm going for a walk. Everyone tells me this is the answer. The entire of lockdown, whenever I felt low, get out, go for a walk, get some fresh air. And I'm like, we're not the same person. That's not going to work for me. And I can't explain to you how quickly it worked for me, getting outside, getting some fresh air. And so I thought, I need a goal. I need a purpose. I can't walk for no reason. I decided to do 10,000 steps a day and see how long I could do it for. And I am converted. I was super hungover yesterday, which again, we're going to talk about that as a fail in a second. Um, and I still got my 10,000 steps in. And annoyingly, all day I felt terrible. And then before I went to pick up the kids, I was like, I've got to get some steps in because otherwise I'm not going to do it. And I felt really, really delicate. And I walked for maybe 10 minutes and I started to feel better and it settled my stomach. And I was raging on the inside that actually exercise may also be the cure to a hangover. <laughs> no, this can't be something I've been fighting against all this time. So number one has to be my 10,000 steps. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be a gym person ever, but this is a massive, massive thing for me. I think I'm like eight days in, more than that by the time you see this, and um, I'm feeling really, really committed. So if those of you like me, who are like, absolutely not, we are house people, not interested, if you'd like some motivation from someone who is like you, not from like a gym bunny, not from, from those people that you never listen to. I like to be taught by someone and mentored by someone who also struggles. I don't need to be taught piano by a prodigy. I want to be taught piano by someone who found it really, really difficult, you know? Um, and if you feel like you're looking for motivation in that kind of arena, come and check out my vlogs because we're talking a lot about this. So that is my number one. I'm really getting out there and doing some exercise every day, which is weird. And it's made a big difference to my life. Shocking. Part and parcel with that, I also started drinking more water. And this was not a conscious decision. I just thought, uh, I'll try at the same time. And I think one thing motivated me to do the other. I'm like, I'm already doing this. Why not? And I found myself not craving Diet Coke all the time. We have so much Diet Coke in the fridge. That never happens because I'm drinking it constantly. And 
when I have a Diet Coke, I'm not drinking it as quickly because I'm not thirsty, because I'm always drinking water. I'm super hydrated for the first time, possibly in my life, and um, drinking it out of, let me show you, let me show you, drinking it out of this ginormous, huge tumbler. Um, I don't even know how many ounces this is, but it's a big tumbler. I put ice in it, it stays cold and like super, super deliciously cold for a very, very long time. Um, has made it really enjoyable. And I'm constantly drinking water out of this. So they're my kind of two massive changes since I last did a video like this. And truly I'm feeling better than I've ever felt before. I've got more energy, I'm sleeping better. And um, I just am feeling, I'm feeling a sense of accomplishment, which is strange. It's an unusual feeling for me, but I'm feeling really good about it. So I get it, not everyone's into it. It's gonna be kind of annoying for those of you who are like me, who are like, I don't care. But I have to share because this is like a real revelation. Um, on the flip side, the fail, I would say, is because I'm now very in tune with like, I really, really want to feel better. Like my joints and things are more sore than they should be at 35. I constantly feel like I've got indigestion. Every single day I feel like I've eaten something that doesn't agree with me. People are telling me, maybe you've got a gluten intolerance, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe you should cut things out. Other people are saying, don't cut things out until you've had a test. We're having these conversations through the vlogs and I am kind of starting to think, well, maybe I need to change the way that I eat um, because I've just kind of accepted that I, this is how I feel. I My digestive situation has always been awful. And I don't even know if I would know if I had food poisoning because it's so normal to feel like, ugh, really not great in that department. Um, and I'm starting to kind of like really assess what I'm eating and try to make small changes. There's going to be nothing huge. You know, I'm still having pizza later. Um, but I'm just kind of starting that journey of like maybe considering making some swaps and and maybe even doing some tests down the, down the line. Um, so I went to my brother's house on Saturday and had too many drinks. And on Mon sorry, on Sunday, on Monday, I was like super hungover, like I say. And it kind of just came to me. I'm now putting so much focus on feeling better in myself. I'm thinking about changing the things that I eat. I'm making a real effort to get out and walking every day. I'm drinking all this water. In what world have I just accepted that if I drink so many drinks, not even that many drinks, that I will feel terrible the next day, but that's just okay. Again, kind of a come to Jesus moment. It also makes me feel really anxious in my older age. Never did when I was in my 20s, but in the last, I'd say five years, I've, I've written about this on my blog before, um, I, it makes me feel very anxious. I don't have a high tolerance for alcohol. I don't drink to excess on a regular basis. I'll have a glass of wine here or there, or a gin and tonic, or a Southern Comfort and Coke, but I'm not drinking like lots and lots and lots on a regular basis. A few times a week I'll have a drink at home, and then when I'm with friends, then I drink to excess, which is not a great habit to get into. I've spoken to so many people about this, like it's so normal. More, I think, here in the UK than it is other, other places, for that to become the thing you do with friends. And possibly more than ever, because we can't go out and do things, we get together in houses and we drink. And we drink more than we would if we went out for dinner. We drink more than we would if we went to the pub because it's just constantly free flowing. And I think probably, I think a lot of people have found this in lockdown drinking alone. But for me, I found that since the majority of my socializations with people are in houses, that seems to be the social thing to do. You get together and you drink. And currently, that's not making me feel good. It's not making me feel, I mean, it never made me feel good, but right now, in this moment, I'm thinking the, the most about me feeling as good as I can possibly feel. And I don't know how I can reconcile doing all these things to make myself feel better on a regular basis. And also, drinking to excess once every few weeks with some friends, and knowing I'm gonna, like, committing already with, I know I'm going to feel terrible tomorrow. Why am I doing this to myself? And Lee's never understood because Lee barely drinks. Like a few drinks here and there, but he's like very, very, he could be teetotal super easily. Um, and he's never really understood because he has a very 
um, sensitive, or he's very sensitive to alcohol. He has a real violent reaction to alcohol. He cannot have much at all. It really makes him feel bad. Um, so he's never really understood the whole thing of like, well, you go out and then the next day you're hungover. It's it's not a good idea. And as I've always said to him, no one does this on purpose. But the more I think about it, the more I think the kind of comes an age where, yes, you don't go out and drink so much that you know you're going to feel bad the next day. You don't go out and while you're drinking, think, I'm okay if I feel really sick tomorrow. But we do know the consequence. And so there does come a point when we're adults where we do know that's going to make us feel that way and we're still doing it. And this is just a stream of consciousness. I'm not saying I'll never do that again because I definitely will. But currently, right now, I'm feeling like that's something that I want to cut out. And so for June, I'm just going to no alcohol. Let's see how I feel. Let's see if that's one of the aggravators um, for me. Because I always thought, well, it's probably IBS. Mom's got IBS. It's probably a thing. That's probably what I've got. Alcohol, I'm sure, is an irritant. Um, And if I'm trying to do these other things to suddenly feel healthier, then it just makes sense to cut it out, doesn't it? But, you know, that's just my ramble. I just wonder, you know, alcohol is such a strange beast because it's sold to us as this facilitator which had never been for me I can go out and not drink happily because I'm an extrovert I literally get high on the company of other people and yet even knowing that about myself because I've been like my best nights out have been when I haven't been drinking and then I feel great the next day and yet still I will get drawn into oh I'll have another one I'll have another one I'll have another one knowing I'm going to feel terrible the next day knowing and you know a couple of drinks here and there doesn't have that same effect but it is it does become the norm to drink another 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 in social company doesn't it it's so strange I would love to hear your thoughts on that because I know lots of people talk about this over Christmas time there's like um people do like dry January and stuff but and maybe it's the heat I don't know currently I'm just like I don't think it's for me right now you know I think it might be a thing that I could cut out and feel better. We don't have a lot of fails, but that was a big one. Right, so let's just get into some of my other favourites. I have got a couple of makeup things to talk about. I've spoken about all of these things before, but just for those of you that haven't seen my previous videos or haven't seen me talk about these things before, they're still favourites and I just want to kind of hit on them occasionally. The Morphe Continuous Setting Mist, I used that again today and was like, I have to include this in Friday's video. Because sometimes I know I'll talk about something and be like, this isn't amazing. This is the best thing I've ever used. And then I never talk about it again. And from your perspective, you might be like, well, so she's blowing smoke. She's like just talking about things as she tries them. Everything's amazing. Not so. This is the best setting spray I've ever used in my life. I've got lots of them. I use them all the time. I just don't think to constantly think of like talking about them because I know I've spoken about them to death at the time. But it's been a while. The thing that I love the most about this, apologies if you've heard this before, but it is a beautiful mist. It's like a mist, like an actual mist. Oh, an aerosol mist. It doesn't run out really quickly because that was my main concern because it's not the cheapest setting mist in the world, but it doesn't run out really quickly. It lasts quite a while. Um, But it does this thing where it kind of melts everything together. So I will like do all the stuff, do the powder, blah, blah, blah. And it kind of, you know, it can look a bit powdery, it can look a little bit cakey, can look a bit makeupy on the skin. And then I do this all over with my continuous setting mist and all of a sudden it all just looks like skin. And it's magic. And I can't tell you that it makes my la- makeup last any longer. I really don't know. But I do know that the minute I put it on, my makeup looks 1000% better. It looks like it's been professionally done. The second I use that mist, it's like, ah, oh, everything is just skin. Depends on what you're into. If you are, I've got the mattifying version. I don't like that as much. Um, if you are into kind of a matte makeup look, this is not going to be for you. But if you are into very, very natural, almost dewy, especially if you're kind of like over 30, you're looking to add a bit more hydration back into your skin after putting on your makeup. There's nothing I've ever used that's as good as this. I was actually sent the Hourglass one last year, year before. Um, and then I never ended up talking about it because I just couldn't understand it. It's the weirdest product. I've been sent a few things from Hourglass, never things that I would necessarily pick up myself, but one was the setting mist. And I don't understand it, it's like sticky. I'll have to do a video and show you some of the products that I've tried and never talked about, because that's one of those ones that's like, I don't get it. 
And then this, by comparison, is a fraction of the cost and magic stuff. This, if you told me this was £40 and it was from Hourglass, I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. And I probably will still buy it. So just to kind of put that in perspective. Um, the Maybelline Fit Me Matte and Poreless. I hope this is still available because this is a little older than it probably should be for me to be using it still. But a few years ago, I was obsessed. I used it again recently and was like, this is still great, great stuff. If you are struggling with makeup not looking great on your skin, because I'm really, that's a thing right now. Um, if you're struggling with that and you want something that looks natural but gives you a good amount of coverage because this can be built up, this is great. It's really, really thin. You can apply it with a brush or your fingers or a sponge, however you want to do it. I would say if you're doing it with a brush, you're probably going to just need to kind of like pat around just to kind of blend in any of the lines because it can streak a little. But either way, um, and it's a decent medium coverage. I've got a very small amount of it on today, so you can kind of still see my skin through it. But I just wanted a bit of an even out. Um, it just gives the most natural finish. Again, I'm looking for something that looks like skin, and that's totally what this is. Obviously, the more that you put on, the more mask-like it's going to be, but it's always going to look, the finish is always going to look like skin. And um, it says, liquid foundation for normal to oily skin. And at the back, it says, mattifies and refines pores with blurring micro powders for poreless looking skin. Matches skin tone and texture, natural, seamless finish. I would agree with all of those things. The shade I have is 115. I think I've gone up and down dependent on the seasons, but this currently is the right colour for me. And then I have two brushes, and that's it for makeup. These I both use like every single time I do my makeup, and I get questions about this one. This was sent to me by It Cosmetics. It's called the Heavenly Lux Complexion Perfection Number no. 7. This is the all over, and this is the conceal. This, I believe in Boots, they do a deal where if you buy the It Cosmetics CC cream and this at the same time, it's like an offer. Um, but it's the number seven brush and I like this for foundation. I like it for just like buffing in my foundation. It's also really, really nice for cream blushes. And I've also used this when it's totally dry and clean. I've used this to um, buff on um, powder highlights which some people are like, that's insane. But I'm telling you, there's something about it and it doesn't take away the product. It just kind of like buffs in the powder highlight and it's so, so pretty. So this is definitely one of my all-time favourites. One of the brushes that if everything was to disappear, I would repurchase in a heartbeat. And then the other one is this, which is the um, Real Techniques setting brush. I have a couple of these and I use these um, for two things. One for powder. So I will take like a loose powder and I just kind of go inner corners, down my nose, down here, basically like my whole, the middle of my face, T-zone-ish, not out here, but like just there, just the inner corners of the eyes, not out here where I've got my lines, and then all down here. And then I'll wait and brush it off and then I do the continuous setting mist. I use it for that. I also use it for highlights. I particularly like it for the hourglass ambient dim light when I just like to put it here. I don't think, I think this is a... Um, I have on the NYX Glow Getter, is it that's what it's called? A liquid highlight today, the pale liquid highlight. Um, so I don't have it on today, but I like to do it here because I like a bit of a glow here. And that's what I use this for too. Really, really like that brush. That's it for the beauty stuff. I've got two more things and they are kind of random. Kind of food and drink, but not. Number one is my Corksicol. You'll have to excuse me because it's a dirty cup right now. I have my coffee in it this morning. I got this with my FabFitFun box obsessed. I'm going to need more of them. The idea of this is it's supposed to be a wine glass originally. It's supposed to be a wine glass that kept your wine cold. They do um, other things that are all like drinks related to keep things cold. I love this as a coffee cup. It keeps my coffee cup for so long. I think it keeps cold drinks cold for let's say four hours and then hot for eight. Something like that. I think it's that way around. Like the, It keeps hot drinks hot for a lot longer than cold drinks cold. It's so good. It's a really kind of weighty thing. It's got a rubber bottom. It doesn't fit in my cup holders, but I have cup holders here in my car and one back here and it fits in that one, which is weird. It doesn't fit in my cup holders, worth noting. Um, but I love it. It's got a lid. If you want it, it, you can close it. Or if I'm at home, obviously I use it without the lid. I just, it keeps my coffee warm for so much longer. Use this all the time. I'm sure that you can get um, much, much cheaper alternatives online if you want to. I am trying to avoid Amazon in a big way. My no buy we're going to talk about on Sunday 
is going to be super focused on Amazon and the supermarkets. But like I say, we'll talk about that in Sunday's video. So I, I don't want to say you can probably find one cheaper on Amazon, but you can find one somewhere online cheaper than a cork skull. I can't tell you whether or not they're as good, but if you can suggest one, if you've got one yourself, let us know. If you've tried multiple ones and you think the cork skull one's worth the money, I'd like to hear that too, because I'm going to need an, another one of these minimum. The other thing I'm obsessed with at the moment is Oreo Double Stuff. I don't think I've ever tried one before and I randomly bought them because they were just like at the checkout in, um, again, supermarkets, the worst place, at the checkout in Asda the other week. Oh my God, they're amazing. They're just exactly a mouthful to me. Like I'll be walking through the kitchen and I'm like, just one right in the mouth, whole thing. That is my little sweet treat. Mm. It's just the right amount of something. Normal Oreos, I could just like eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. These ones, there's something about the ratio I'm really into. While I'm going on my walks and listening to this Drama Queens podcast, this is um, Hilary Burton, Bethany Joy Lenz and, come on, Sophia, Sophia, no, I can't get it. The people from One Tree Hill, Sophia, Sophia Bosch. Sophia Bush. Brooke, um, I'm really, really enjoying their podcast because they're talking about their experience working on One Tree Hill and they're going to, it's basically like a rewatch podcast. So each episode is going to be a different um, episode of the show. I rewatched the show last year. I was considering rewatching it and then I realised it's not on any streaming platforms, which is annoying. I think it went off as I was watching it last year. Well, I do have some episodes that I downloaded through Apple, so I might rewatch some of them just for the nostalgia. But I loved that show so much. And I'm kind of like reliving it through the podcast. So that's a fun thing. Um, I do listen to like a lot of self-helpy things that are part like interviews that feel very self-helpy. And it's a nice change to listen to something a bit more frivolous and a bit more nostalgic. And I really like those three girls. I follow them on Instagram and really enjoy them separately. I love Hilary Burton's love story with Jeffrey D. Morgan. Um, Bethany Joy Lenz is like a completely different kind of person to me, but so creative and really interesting, very religious. And that in itself, I find fascinating. I find religion real. I could sit and talk to someone all day long about their religion. I am not a religious person, but I don't feel strongly against a religion of any kind. I'm just interested, you know? I find it really interesting to hear how about people's faith and belief. Um, and then Sophia Bush is very kind of business minded and she's done some really awesome things as well. So it's, I like the three girls and I find that a, a nice podcast to listen to. And like I say, it's very nostalgic. It's nice. It's interesting. So that's what I've been listening to. Um, in terms of watching Desperate Housewives is coming to an end. I am considering watching Grey's Anatomy from the very, very beginning again. And we've picked up on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. We used to watch this years ago. We're Real Housewives of New York people. But we did watch Real Housewives of Beverly Hills from the beginning. We tried to pick it back up again and we had to skip some seasons because we just weren't getting into it at all. I think we skipped to season six because we'd only watched the first few like years ago. So we're on season six now. I, I'm obsessed with Lisa Rinna and... I don't know how we didn't always hate Lisa and Ken because they're the worst people. I just can't find anything endearing. Remember, I'm on season six, so anything could happen. But at this point, I'm like, everything they do and say, they're not nice people. <laughs> just, it's not even like, like there are people on the New York Housewives where, I'm, I'll give you the example of Ramona. Ramona is completely thoughtless. I don't think she necessarily does care about other people. But in the back of my mind, I've always had with Ramona, like, she's just an idiot. She's an idiot. She's not with it. She's just like, in her own world, idiot. I think the difference between her and Lisa and Ken is Lisa and Ken seem very clever and very sharp. And I just don't like them. You know? This will need to be alive. In lockdown, we did a lot of lives talking about Below Deck and such, but I just, we're watching it now and I'm like, there is just nothing redeeming about these characters. And I am aware, these are not the people. I wouldn't necessarily judge the actual people on 
the characters they play on reality TV. Because I think that sometimes they are, there are seeds planted, they're, they're playing a part. Sometimes if you know your part in the show is the villain, then you're going to go in a certain direction. I'm certain that the producers say, we want you to bring this up at this thing and we want you to be really hard with this person. I think there's direction involved. This is how I feel. Um, I think sometimes there's a plot that's already been decided ahead of the season. So much as I'm like, I don't like this person. I don't like the characters they're playing on this reality TV show. Whether or not that's really how they are, I, I will never know. But I just do want to make that clear distinction because I don't ever think reality TV is really reality TV. But I really do enjoy Lisa Rinna, like in all facets of everything. I just think she's a good time. Anyway, that's it for today's video. We really, that was a roller coaster. That was all over the shop. I'd be really interested to hear about um, how you're feeling like, especially if you're at like kind of my age, where I don't know if it's the same for people. It, may, it probably is. It's probably just like um, a UK culture thing. But the thing of alcohol being the, the centerpiece of everything is everything. Like if I have people around, the first thing I think is like, what am I going to make for drinks? Like I'm really into making cocktails and that's not going to change. I, I enjoy making cocktails but that doesn't have to be the thing like you invite people around for drinks we go to the pub to drink it feels so intertwined with our social behavior and I think probably what why it's like also in the forefront of my mind is we haven't been able to socialize for so long but now it feels all the more emphasized that like wow okay this is all we do this is what we do we get together and we drink can't think of the last time I had like, let's all go out and do something where there wasn't a discussion of like, so who's driving? Who's driving so everybody else can drink? Or is someone picking this person up or what? Because it's assumed that you can't possibly have a plan to see each other without alcohol being involved. And it's just like all of a sudden being like, hmm. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It is weird. It's a strange thing. And since it's not making me feel good, it's, it's all the more like, you know, I'm interested. I'm interested to hear your thoughts because I think more and more people um, are giving up completely. I don't know if I could do that because I really do enjoy a cocktail. But I think more and more people are realising like this doesn't need to be our, the epicentre of everything in the way that our culture seems to make it. But, you know, again, discuss. I'll be interested. We'll talk about it next Friday. Uh, and I will be back on Sunday with another video about money and spending and no buys and uh, all of that jazz. See you then. Bye.